Welcome to Selling in the Motor Trade, in association with Automotive Management and Simcoe Training. This is the weekly podcast where we share best practice, tips, and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve your service department, and generally put more profit into your dealership or dealer group. I'm your host, Simon Bokert, or some of you might already know me as Skippy. And firstly, I want to say thank you for taking the time to tune in. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Selling in the Motor Trade. First, I'm going to say thank you, thank you again for all the comments. Uh, we're getting so many nice comments and direct messages, people coming through, how the podcast is helping uh, their team, themselves personally. Please send them through. I really appreciate it. I'm going to ask a favor. If you get a chance to go and review us on Apple Podcast Reviews, Spotify, please do it. Um, send me a direct message, show us the review you've done, and I'll personally reach out to you because it just helps so much. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much for that. And today I'm joined with Darren Bedford. Darren Bedford is a sales director for Simcoe Training. We've worked together for, uh, goodness me, must be eight or nine years now. And this is the one where we're going to put the world to right. We're going to talk all things about the motor trade because there's been a few things that happened in the motor trade over the last couple of years. So Darren, welcome aboard. Thank you, Simon. Good to be back. That's it. I've got to ask you, sir, when did you start the motor trade? How many years ago was it? Oh, about 30, just under 35 years ago now. Started when you were 10. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't look old enough. Yeah. It's, it actually works for a podcast. It does. It certainly <laughs> does. Listen, in the time you've been working the motor trade, have you seen anything like what we've gone through over the last couple of years? Um, pandemics, uh, pent up demands, stock. No, not at all. I mean, interesting enough, you, we, we're in an industry where sometimes the, the general message is, oh, yeah, but things stay the same. I've seen all sorts of things. I can remember getting to a period where we took pot exchanges in and we actually had to pay. So, you know, I was always sort of brought up with it was worth £50 or it was worth £75, no matter what condition it was in. And mm -hmm. then we got to a stage where we actually had to pay to get the cars removed because the price of steel and the recycling of them ah, of course. was non-existent. So there's been sort of changes that have changed the way we've had to go out. We've had to go and face the customer and say, look, you take your car off, you put, but, but it's actually going to cost you money to buy exchange it. Um, so there's been weird things like that that have happened. But, it, you know, it's unprecedented, A, what's gone on, and, and B, where the used car market is at the current moment. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, who would have ever thought that putting your money into a car would have actually earned you some money over the last six months? That's so, so true. And now for people, I need to timestamp this because I know a lot of people listen to podcasts. They go back and listen to them on bulk and do stuff like this. So at the moment, we just hit July in 2022. And I think it's fair to say used car prices are softening. Are we coming back to normality now? Uh, are they dropping off a cliff edge? What, what's your gut feel speaking to the dealers out there on the floor? What's, what's happening with used car prices? Yeah, I think the general feel is I don't think they're going to drop off a cliff. I don't think they'll return any any time soon to the, the sort of values that we saw pre uh, this position. But nevertheless, they are coming back down again. And that changes mindset. You know, one of the biggest things about the industry that we work in is the, you know, the attitude, the approach to things. And, you know, if we think it's a great deal, we tend to communicate that to a customer. So we're, we're starting to get to that period where we're having to deal with sort of expectations of people that maybe have seen their car at the top dollar when they started doing some research online about a car. They've got a valuation on their vehicle. They're now coming into the dealership. And instead of it being a pleasant surprise that it's gone up a little bit, it may have softened a little bit. So there could be 500, 600 pounds difference from that very first sort of tentative look around in their, in their shopping period to where they're getting valuations today in dealership. So, you know, it, it is a, it, it's going to be an ongoing process. It's coming back the way we're probably more familiar with, but we just need to remember the work and the effort that we used to have to put in in order to yeah. make that work. Well, I just want to ask, do you remember 2007, 2008? Sorry, would have been 08, 09, when the world went to crap. I can <laughs> remember um, I was in a Land Rover business and I think a Range Rover Sport at the time was something like four or five grand a month 
it was dropping. Yeah. Um, are we going to come back to that situation at the end of this year? Um, the supply of new cars is still limited. Is it going to drop off a cliff like that, do you think? What's the gut feel of the dealers you're speaking to out there? The, the gut feel of the dealers I'm speaking to is, is a general, but they don't think that it's ever going to reach that same sort of point um, in, in the near future. It's not like we're going to go along and it's going to drop off a cliff. It will be a gradual decline back to, to a similar position potentially as to, to, to what it was before. Um, but but the, the, the supply aspect of the stock that's available out there at the moment means that there's still not sufficient stock. It, it, there's, there's more of it, but there's still not sufficient stock to really have that market effect. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, who knows? And, and just going back to what you were saying there in 2008, I remember interviewing a salesperson that wanted to come out of a Land Rover dealership because of exactly that reason. You know, he was culturally, he was used to changing his customers every 12 months and maybe taking 10,000 pounds off them and popping them into a new car and on they went and he could ask them for that sort of money. He was struggling like anything to sell cars, whereas then having to ask for 20 or 25,000 to get these people into a new car. That wasn't customer driven. That was his own yeah. you know, issues, if you like, in terms of being able to, um, to deal with the market change that's there. And we will get that to a certain degree now because people have become more familiar, as I say, with those higher prices, with those differences between their pot exchange and the new car that they're looking at being almost kind of irrelevant is that look it's about that focus back on a high pot exchange figure mm. you know I, you know, people sort of say well yeah but the new cars were high, are higher priced so the, the cost to change you know if you come out of a car now and you get a very good deal on your pot exchange but you go and buy a brand new one probably doesn't change greatly because you're putting that money back into a new one but the reality of it is that psychological thing of I was getting X for my car is always logged in here because when we sell something, we always want the highest price that we can for our pot exchange. So if we've been, as I say, in that shopping phase and we've seen offers of, I don't know, let's pick a figure and say we've had offers of 15, we're now coming to market and talking to dealers, but we're only being offered 13 and a half, 13, 14,000. It, it just doesn't seem like a good deal, although it probably is possibly even a better deal than it was back then. So, mm. you know, it will be definitely a cultural thing to deal with with the teams, for sure. Well, I, I just want to expand on that because I, I think we've got to be careful of a perfect storm that's happening. Firstly, we've had salespeople, and, and you use this phrase all the time, it's been low-hanging fruit. I mean, yep. you, you didn't have to be a genius to sell used cars 12 months ago. Okay, and, and we all know that. That's no disrespect to anyone there that's made fortunes selling used cars. Okay, you didn't have to be a genius. Um, but here's the perfect storm. You've got salespeople not prepared to or forgotten how to build value, negotiate, trial close, do demonstration drives, because quite frankly, they haven't had to. Yep. Next thing, you've got a whole lot of customers. I'm going to use this word. They're addicted to paying 500 a month for their car. Okay. Yep. Now, going forward, though, interest rates seem to be only going one way. Price of cars tend to be going up. Every uh, OEM has taken the advantage, or maybe they have to, with distribution costs are going through the roof, building costs are going through the roof, like everything is, labor yep. costs going through the roof yep. Yep, for them. So the price of new cars are going through the roof. The customers trade in. Their park exchange is never going to be worth as much as it is today if it keeps coming down gradually or drops off a cliff. So it strikes me we're going to have a whole lot of salespeople having to get used to taking a customer from paying 500 a month to, hey, Mr. Customer, getting the same level of car that you're driving currently, we're going to be asking more like, what, 800, 850, or whatever it's going to be. Yep. So what are you doing in the dealers? At Firstly, how many dealers are, are prepared for that? How many dealers know that's happening? And while you're on the floor, what are you doing? And what do you think the sales manager, listen, this should do to get the salespeople ready for that challenge? Yeah, so I, yeah, you're dead right, Simon. I, th I think the best analogy I can use is, you know, if you're a one-man band as a plumber and you're flat yeah. out busy at the current moment, now is exactly the time that you want to be marketing your business because you don't want to wait until you've got that spare time to be able to market your business in order to be able to get the, the clientele back in. It's too late then. You're going to be in a peak and a trough of situation. So 
um, there are all sorts of things. You know, I, could the dreaded pizza night be back for prospecting? I certainly hope not um, for a couple of reasons. You know, we're a lot more tactical now with, and we, and we should be a lot more tactical with our prospecting. We're going to need to be able to sell what we've got, not just sell cars, not just sell volume. It's going to have to be a mixture as, as that stock comes back up. There's going to be certain vehicles that are going to need to be promoted. Um, and, and that's all down to a tactical uh, delivery of that. But targeted, also we're going to, targeted, yeah, targeted, yeah. And we're also going to have to get back into that situation that we probably haven't been in for the last two years, which is we need to be contacting those people on a regular basis and looking to change them out of their cars. You know, we've had that sort of wave of people coming in, looking to change, enough business happening. You know, uh, it certainly is one of my phrases about low hanging fruits, but equally, I know the one that you tend to use is shooting fish in a barrel. You know, it's been easy then, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we just need to be open and honest with ourselves that that's how it's been mm -hmm. at that particular time. And we need to ready ourselves and prepare ourselves for what's coming down the track, because if we don't get ourselves prepared for it, we'll pass through, we'll miss our September big plate month change in the, yeah, in, in the yeah. UK. Um, and then we'll be into the back end. And, you know, typically in a normal year, the back end of the year is all down to how quickly it drops off. You know, it will drop off at some point. If it drops off in December, it's, it's probably expected. But if it starts to drop off October, November and December, there's an awful lot of money that could be lost in that period. While people you know, realise that they need to get match fit for, you know, what's coming our way. So in, in answer to your question, that's exactly what we're working with. We're working at getting back to those targeted prospecting, mm -hmm. you know, not one particular one event, but culturally getting it back in place that it happens every single day, the little and often scenario. And I know yeah. you've certainly done lots of um, uh, sessions there, Simon, on, on the how you know contacting a few people each day but doing it every single day yeah. drives the numbers and, and the effectiveness of prospecting through the roof and makes it a much more manageable task yeah i heard a, a phrase a while back and it really resonated with me it said um you don't get fat eating one pizza and you don't get yeah. thin eating one salad okay yeah. it's a consistent habit that actually will make the change one way or the other. And I, I just like that with prospecting. So many times we do the Rhino. We had the guys from Rhino on here with the VIP yeah. events and whatever. We, uh, you know, the good newsletter, the bad newsletter, the great newsletter, the spectacular <laughs> newsletter. I don't know what they're called now. And sorry if anyone here is involved with that. Dan, I know you're a great guy. You do well, okay? Um, but actually some of those are panic moments, I think. Yeah. I like the idea of getting back to do it consistently. Yeah. Um, actually prospecting in my view shouldn't be something that we just do uh you know twice a year when we need to do it it needs to be consistent and those numbers we talk about all the time five a day five yeah. a day times five days a week it's 25 times 48 weeks a year if you're going to have some holidays there's 1200 calls those 1200 calls which are targeted you spent the time to have a look at it yeah i know we've got um key to key and these um, equity managers and these parity managers. I love them. They're sensational. But actually, here's a message for business managers, sales managers out there. Please be careful what information you give to your salespeople on them. Because I've seen salespeople only pick through on those equity manager systems, the ones they can get into a customer for the same amount of what yep. they're spending at the moment. Yep. You just can't do that at the moment. And you're not going to. And it's missing the point. It, it's totally missing the point. All you're changing somebody on is a payment. Whereas yeah. if you find that person that has a need for a car where their car need has changed, yes. you're fulfilling their desired situation. You're changing them from their current situation to their desired situation. You'll find people will pay a lot more money in those circumstances than they will in the other side. The other point I'd make is because of the change in service, um, you know, uh, schedules, the extension of MOTs, where that, you know, as a result of the pandemic, where that was extended. Lots of information that's held on the computers now is kind of out of date. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore, you know, I don't know enough about it, but I certainly wouldn't be reliant on a key to key system where you've had residual values completely through the through the roof, because for the next sort of six months, everything's going to look desperate from from where it was before. 
Um, so, you know, it, it genuinely, it's a number situation. And, 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 you know, we talk about this often, Simon, it's the, the, the really successful guys. If I could knit one common theme through each of those individuals, they're the people that turn up for work and believe that they are working for themselves in yeah. the independent dealership that they're, that they're at. Because when you get that mentality, you just look at it and say, if I could contact 1,200 people, it doesn't matter if I just have a good morning, good afternoon. If it's remained in their memory, if they were in for a part, but I knocked the socks off them while they were in collecting that part, where's that customer going to come back to? Where's that customer going to feel empathy and warmth? And if I care about the business that I work at, those 1,200 people will know for the next three years where I am and where it's worth coming into. And sure, I might have that conversation and they come and deal off a colleague of mine. But also what goes around comes around. You know, I'll pick up the other people's in the same way. But it's having that real passion that it's your business and that, you know, you'd want, you'd be out there. If it was your business, you'd be out there walking that floor, meeting everybody, welcoming them, shaking their hand, thanking them for coming down. It would be genuine. It would be sincere. And all of a sudden, you know, selling cars becomes slightly easier. Well, it's it's a couple of things that you I want to pick up on there. How many people's lives have changed over the pandemic? OK, they're now not doing the mileage they used to do. We know that that's driven a lot of the house prices because people changed and spent time at home. I know my own personal circumstances. I was going from 35,000 miles a year down to like five or six because yeah. we're in the studio so much now. And that's just changed completely where EV, I thought that's ah, never going to work for me. So now, next time I look at change the car, you know, EV's high up on the agenda. Um, and I always love it when you're doing prospecting, you're taking people out of the jazz to the CRV or the CRV to HRV or something like that. It's an easier prospect when they're changing it. When it's like for like, yeah, uh, you know what? That is just a payment you're selling. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that, you know, when circumstances change, there's no greater motivation for a customer to change that vehicle. If it's no longer doing what they originally had that um, car for, then next time they come to change, there's a stronger motivation to change it based on the fact that I'm going to accomplish what I want. And that might be downsizing. You know, it might be a simple situation of, actually, I don't use it anymore. I don't need it as much. Um, it might be that they need to divert some of the funds. You know, in the past, one of the things that, you know, don't um, sort of, if, you, if it's not relevant to you, but um, you perhaps don't necessarily think, but a lot of people were buying yearly season tickets to collect trains into to and from London. Now, of course, we've reduced um, working in London, in, in, in places like that. They're paying ad hoc for their travel into London which, you know, again, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a benefit because if they're going in three times a week, then the season ticket would, you know, there's a cutoff point between those. So it might be actually to have a car out there depreciating, to be paying more on your transport to get in and out of London. You might want to downsize, you know, I only use it at the weekends, I could do with something a bit smaller. Or, but all of those factors will be far more motivational, if you like, and create more desire in that customer to change than ever you will in swapping somebody into the same vehicle. And, and, and you know, you're right in saying what we'll be targeting, you know, is, is meeting the monthly repayment. But, but um, also, <laughs> sorry. But also we have to target stock we can get. Listen, yeah. we know that stock's coming through and uh, diff depending on the franchise you're in, you know that sometimes, yeah, yeah, we can get that stock all day long. It's fine. Uh, I was in a Dublin Porsche dealership and Taycan wasn't too bad for them. Okay, yeah. and delivery time. Uh, listen, I spoke to someone in a Porsche dealership in the UK and they said, what? We're two years away, minimum. So yeah. clearly it's country to country. It's not just brand to the brand. So surely any prospecting on uh, we want to buy your car approach that I know lots of training providers have been talking about down the track. Surely we've got to actually talk about what car we can get first before we go down that approach. Yeah, without a doubt, the, the, the relevance of, who you contact, how you contact them, and what message that you have to, to carry out to them, you know, should be an essential part of the planning of, of, of the people that you go after and the, the people that you, you know, discuss those options with. Um, this blanket kind of approach is interesting. You made the reference to one piece, eat one piece, and it doesn't make you fat. But um, for some of the older uh, listeners there, well, they'll probably remember those times where we were like the plumber who'd run out of business. And it was like, right, guys, Friday night, pizza. We're going to sit here. We're going to make loads of calls. We're going to make appointments. And, 
you know, that approach is, is, is just isn't going to be able to cut it in the current situation. You know, mm. it's going to need to be a lot more targeted around the availability of that stock that's there, how we can promote that stock and how we can meet our numbers based on the availability of the, 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 the stock that we have and the stock that we carry. And also, you know, without buying that used car issue, you know, we still want the stock that we want for used yeah. cars. Yeah. You know, there's a great saying, what sells well new sells well used. Yeah. You know, and, and equally, there's probably every in every manufacturer out there some cars that you knew you know that you definitely wouldn't want to be buying back in as, as used car stock. So yeah, can, can I tell you one of the mistakes I made um, in a uh, a Mazda dealer? Yeah. And this was Mazda Island. And John Perry, I know you're a listener of the podcast. And hello, sir. How are you? Um, and David McGonagall was out there at the time. And we were doing some prospecting training. And there was a lad uh, in one of the Mazda dealerships um, in, in the Dublin region. Wouldn't be fair to, to name which one. <laughs> and he's his manager phoned me up and said, what the hell have you taught whatever the lad's name was, okay? Because he decided to go down the, hey, we want to buy your car route, okay? And we we're going through, and, and the bit that he missed, bless him, was pick stock that we'd want back in. Two to four years old. At the time, the Mazda RX-8. Now, I can hear all the Irish listeners laughing at the moment. The Mazda RX-8 didn't have the best reputation in Ireland. Uh, the tax on the car, the road fund license, the tax for other people around the world listen to this, I believe overnight went to something like 2,150 euros, okay? The cars were devaluing like a stone. And this poor lad, through no fault of his own, phoned the first customer on his prospect list who happened to have a Mazda RX-8. He said, hey, listen, I know it's a strange question. It's probably the last thing in your mind, but there's any chance we could buy it off you. Now, of course, the customer must have said something along the line, yes, you can, no problem. Okay, well, when do you want to come down? No, I'll come and see you now. Okay, are you there? Okay, he went, wow, this is a hot stream. Let's phone all the Mazda RX-8 customers. <laughs> uh, and bless him, this would not be stock that we wanted. And the poor lad, he was just absolutely destroying every customer there. Um, so I suppose what I learned on that one is make sure we're only phoning people on stock we'd want if that's the call you're going to make. But of course, that's only one part of prospecting. We talk about, what, seven different sources. I mean, PCP. Um, yeah. th th there's so many different things that still have to happen. People on PCP well, have to make a choice. Have to make a change. And one of the things that we've talked about, obviously, as a benefit of that is that, you know, it should give some market stability because there is a decision to be made at that point of changing the PCP that something needs to happen. But again, it would be, um, you know, a, a huge area is going to be how that individual person is looked after at that point of change or in the lead up to that change cycle of that PCP. Because, you know, if, if they're looking to change their vehicle and they're getting ridiculous prices that, you know, it, it doesn't stack up or there's no reason why they should change it, but they remember coming in and, you know, using your figure there of the magical 500 pounds, you know, and all of a sudden it's looking like 600, then there always is an option. The option is to refinance the, 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 the remainder of the payment or whatever, or hand the car back if, if circumstances really dictate. So we really still need to get very much under the skin of those individuals and understand what they use the vehicle for, what now could be a possible alternative for, for them. Um, and, you know, in gender, the fact that now is a good time to change that car, not just begin the, in the sort of situation where we're going like, oh, shame you didn't change sort of six months ago. It was really busy then. It was, you know, we'd have paid you a lot more for your car back then. I'm exaggerating, of course, people aren't saying that, but your body language can often yeah. disclose a lot about how good a deal Quite you true. feel that deal is. Yeah, I, I just think salespeople need to get better at objection handling, better at building value in the product, better at showing people their car, what needs to be spent on it, uh, better at um, managing the customer's expectations, things that we just haven't had to do over the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, I just want to manage your expectations. Before anyone buys your car, they're going to have to get it through that NCT test or that MOT test or that roadworthy test whatever country you're in. Someone's going to have to put a warranty on the vehicle and hope nothing goes wrong with it over the next 12 months. They're going to have to pay GST or VAT on any profit they make. 
okay? Uh, and they're not going to do it for their health. They're going to do it because they want to earn some money. All those things we need to get back into slowing slowing the process down, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, get back to basics, if that's the right phrase for that. Yeah, it is. Um, I think John Major destroyed the phrase. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, absolutely that. It, it's going back through that situation. And it's amazing how, you know, one of the things when we deal with um, the more experienced guys and you go back through some of the stuff that, you, you know, the, the penny kind of drops and go, I used to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember when I stopped doing it. I, uh, you know, I know aviation is close to you, Simon. We, we talk regularly about that same thing. If you're a commercial airline pilot, your regularly performance is regularly checked yeah. by an independent person who evaluates your performance on you know every single takeoff and landing that you've done over the last however however period. And the reason that is is because we're human. We get into a, a process. We get into it, and we believe that we're doing all what we were doing before and what's you know we've not necessarily massively changed but what has massively changed is the marketplace around us and now is as good a time as any to get back into that thought process of i need to start to get that process operating smoothly and working through it won't whatever happens it won't send you any less cars but i tell you what when the market starts to turn and, and get to that tougher period it will definitely help you sustain you know, a, a, a performance level because you'll understand what you're doing and when things aren't going quite right, you'll know what to change in that process to make, to, to make sure that you maintain yourself. I want to get your view from um, being out on the floor all the time because you spend your life in dealerships. Uh, you, you speak to what's actually happening out there. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen with PCP? Now, again, other countries, my apologies for this. This is probably going to be more UK specific, but we've got the trend of uh, personal contract hire, leasing. OK, yeah. and PCP, personal leasing was just growing and growing and growing. OK, and um, what's your views? What's what's going to happen? Because surely a lot of the brokers will be struggling to get stock because, quite frankly, why would the OEM make available some cars to the brokers? Brokers tend to work on when there's yeah. an oversupply situation, in my experience, yeah. um, from a customer's point of view. I just want to get your views a personal customer, not business, personal. Are they looking more to contract hire? Are they looking more to PCP or just straight HP? Well, I tell you a real eye opener for me, and, and these are what I would call big volume taps that the manufacturers have used in the past, Motability notably being one of those sources, big large companies being another, but rental companies being another one on top of that. If anybody's rented a car recently, you'll have noticed a couple of things. The age of the fleet has gone up uh, and may not be immediately apparent, but it will be when you sit behind the speedometer. Okay, yeah. what I mean by that is it might only be a year old, but you'll have a telephone numbers on the on the clock. And the price of hiring, hiring or renting that vehicle has gone up massively for a day rate. Now, there's a re the reason for that is because the deals aren't there to change that fleet over that was making it you know, able to supply it at a much more cost-effective method because the cars were coming into them at next to nothing, whereas now they're having to write that um, a different amount off those vehicles. The rental price has gone, you know, probably even in some cases, twice as much as you would have yeah. got one for pre-pandemic. You know, certainly, I, I, you know, I'd have, in, on occasions that I'd have done it, probably you know, £25 prior to the insurance and stuff like that. But the baseline for a day's hire of, you know, a reasonable sort of mid-sized car might have been £25 on a deal. You, you'll be looking double that at the current moment to hire a vehicle. So there's a good indicator as to what's happened out there yeah. in the market. It's a really interesting question about PCP. Um, it's probably my gut feel from all the time I do spend on the floor, but we had a really good product in the industry called PCP that was structured in a way that meant that when the customer got near the end of their uh, payment profile, they actually had some equity. Mm -hmm. And then I think we probably all got a bit greedy. And what we started to do as manufacturers, looking at those vehicles, started to up the, the GMFE, which meant that when the customer brought it back, there was very little equity in those vehicles. So it was almost almost like a personal contract in itself. Whereas I think if we'd have still had that deposit to go again, we'd have had a different product to compete with the brokers because that product would have, you know, when you come back, you've got some equity, you can go again in the car. 
we tried to compete and we sort of sold a PCP, but we very little equity. And there were certainly in some instances where it was necessary for them to be buying a brand new vehicle in order to get them out of what they owed on the, on the, on the PCP when they bought it back. Now, that, that's what was happening. And then all of a sudden chuck into that the fact that prices have gone through the roof. The GMFE now is down here. So people will have sold their cars on PCP recently and maybe made, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 pounds technically profit or money that they wouldn't have made previously when they've exchanged that car. So again, do they get into the habit of now thinking the next one that they take on a PCP? Oh, that's really good. Last time I sold it, I get back in my hand nearly 5,000 pounds when I handed it back. So again, it's, it's making sure when we're talking to those customers, we're understanding what their expectations are around the purchase that they're making, what's right for them now, how that's changed as a result of the pandemic and the, the new working schedule that they have and all those sorts of things that come into it. Um, but, but for, you know, I, certainly with brokers, I've seen, you know, a softening in the availability of the deals that's there. The only thing I would say, Simon, is when volume comes back to the marketplace and those products are readily available, there'll always be that attraction to, to pump them through those those sources yeah. uh, and the reason i say that is if you go back to that 2008 period where we were putting factories on shorter weeks to stop the supply and all those sorts of things and we kind of went there was that that, that period where everybody went oh that's that, that's good you know we're not oversupplied we, we come yep. back and then very quickly it just gets to the situation where there's oversupply in the market there's pressure it's all about the, the volume right. volume volume Great question. So how quick do you think manufacturers will? Now, listen, we've upset the brokers now. So if there's any brokers listening to this, there's the apologies. Now we're going to upset the OEMs. Okay. Now, I think that the dealer world, um, the investors kind of like the way at the moment that there's a uh, not that oversupply situation. There's not this pre-reg cycle, that the forced market, let's call it that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I'm hearing lots of people saying long that continue. My only concern is... As a group of people, um, we have very, very short memory. Okay, yeah. so individual person might have a long memory, but so many times history repeats itself. So, in your view, my concern is: is it when when semiconductors, when wiring looms come through, how quickly does Mercedes say, "No, no, no, we're not chasing market share, but oh, we could beat BMW," and then BMW say, ah, "But we can beat Audi." And how quickly do we go back to that oversupply? Because my concern is. Most of the manufacturers are just that, manufacturers, brilliant at manufacturing and developing product. That's what they're good at, but they're engineering-led companies, and they'll always want to produce and engineer as most efficiently they can, so many cars that mm. they can. So your gut feel when I'm ranting there, how quickly before we go into an oversupply, or do we actually, do the manufacturers say, no, that's why we're going down agency. It's not going to happen. I want to get your views on that can of worms. Well, it's an interesting one because I can remember back 15 years ago or so, pilot operations looking at doing distribution that was almost just in time for the customer. So the idea was you walked into the dealership, placed an order, and your vehicle was ordered within a six-week period. That vehicle that you ordered was arriving at the dealership to meet for your supply. Um, which meant that the dealerships were not supposed to carry any stock. And, mm -hmm. and all of those sorts of things were being explored, trialed, uh, and, um, and kind of in some instances got quite far down the track. Um, you know, I wouldn't go into the particular manufacturer, but there was a manufacturer that very much did that. They ordered the stock for your showroom that you had to supply it, have in the, and everything else was... Oh, sorry, that was out group. of the dealer's hands. The manufacturer ordered yeah. your showroom stock. Yeah. Wow. Um, but it was for a very short period of time only um, before it reverted back to the city because it doesn't give you that market ability to be able to yeah. sales are up. Right. I have stock that I can supply. And, you know, like anything, it's based on it. And there's some epics out there. Um, does anybody remember the Peugeot 1007 with mm -hmm. the side opening slide doors? Oh, well, yeah. One, 1007. 1007. Yeah. 1007. Yeah. yeah. Not the 107, the 1007. And it had sliding doors that came, you know, that, that really set it up as something completely different in the marketplace. Well, the sales projections for that vehicle 
were, were colossal, you know, what, what was believed to be going to be sold in the UK market. The actual reality was very different. And yeah. of course, the difference between that is you've produced, you've ordered production of those units to fulfill it. So, you know, it's not, it's not even necessarily just that. Is that, that sorry, I'm cutting you off there. Is that why that car ended up being a mobility specialist? I thought it was the doors made it easier for a wheelchair access, but was it more an oversupply and hence mobility would massive, massively, yeah. Um, yeah. And you're right, it did end up becoming it was almost like the mobility car as a result of that. But the yeah. initial target audience was very much not centered yeah. around that. It was it was centered around the practicality of pulling into parking spaces yep. that you know we all do these days and you know actually probably makes a bit of sense that they go down yep. the side but um yeah so um you know it's not only just the the sort of bravado of i want to be this number above somebody else it's about every sales prediction being right um again a story from my past i remember they did a very special um promotion on a car this is going back probably about 25 years. And then they did a headline price that got the phones ringing off the, the hook for the entry level car. And um, I remember talking to a, a colleague of mine who worked in distribution at the time and just sort of said, we just can't get the cars. You know, we've got so many orders coming in and all the rest of it. Um, or people phoning up about these cars. Why can't we just get more supply? And he actually said, Darren, if we ordered the amount of stock that the Neva network has ordered on us, OK, then we would have about four and a half years of stock in this country at the previous sales rate. So you've got that situation as well where, you know, have I got accurate demand information or have yeah. I got each dealership saying, well, can't get hold of them at the minute. Let's put five, let's let's put down five or ten more of those, because that, again, forces this magnitude. And, you know, if you press the button and order the vehicles based on that number, you probably have quite a lot of egg on your face come the end of the year and quite a lot of oversupply. So I think the manufacturing process and, and the way that it operates is, is always going to lend itself to that. I guess the only answer to how long that takes but um, is a combination of the economy in itself, the strength of the economy and the confidence in the, in the marketplace itself, and also obviously the, the supply of those products and those items that come back. But, you know, we have a bit of a, that are happening on multi-levels anyway, because we have the, obviously the run out of internal combustion engines mm -hmm. and the introduction of the EV vehicles, you know, across the, uh, every manufacturer. Um, so the, you know, the market's sort of being subdivided and categorized. And, you know, one would suggest that if um, the remainder of the internal combustion engines caught up with supply again, then there may even become a period where, well, they'll need to be sold by a deadline time. And if there's stock available, the price is going to tumble on those. And, you know, you've got so many market dynamics happening at the moment. I think it would be very, very difficult for anybody to predict. And what all that does is it just says what you need to do is have a business that is shaped to make the most of the circumstances that you're going through at that time. Because that, that's going to, the people that are going to win are the ones that can change and adapt the quickest. Mm. Um, yeah, um, I, I just want to get your views then. Okay, um, agency model. Okay, it's uh, we have more and more investors I speak to us all the time about what's happening. Uh, clearly, I'm Australian, so they've heard what's happened with Honda in Australia, Mercedes in Australia. I, I believe Mercedes UK is uh, first next year. They're going agency. They're so far down the track. Um, speaking to dealers and colleagues in the Australian market. Um, hello, Patrick Tessier, great listener and a, a fan of the show. Um, the way that some of the OEMs have done it out there leaves a lot to be desired. Um, I think, um, and reading between the lines, I spoke to someone uh, in the UK market, actually, and this is not Patrick Tessier, but he was out in the Australian market, or no, sorry, speaking to an Australian colleague recently and said, of the people who are agency, Lots of them would hand it back at the moment, which, which was an interesting thing. So this is a huge can of worms because, of course, there's agency, there's true agency, there's hybrid agencies, there's non. Uh, uh, there's so many titles out there. I don't think people really know. Uh, what's your take on agency? Is it happening? Uh, should we be nervous? Should we be scared? Is it going to affect the value of the investor's investment? 
It sounds like you're tossing that ball up just so that we can now really oh, offend yeah. every one of the listeners that across dealership, environment, manufacturing, oh, yes. IBM, et cetera. Yeah. It's um, such a tough one, isn't it? Such it, a tough it, one. It is. I, I think one thing that we have seen a lot of with the dealerships uh, is the realisation, um, and I don't mean it in a derisory way, but how probably the industry became very much busy fools. Um you know, the slowing down of it and just sort of saying, okay, protecting the profit margin in that particular vehicle and selling a much smaller quantity Mm -hmm. has meant that just about every single dealership has gone, well, that works. You know, so there is some um, credence in that whole um, situation. Um, I've got to be honest, from my perspective, and it is only my view, I'm uncomfortable with it. Um, And the reason I'm uncomfortable with it is that it's, um, if it was my business and my investment, I'd want full control of that. Um, I'd want that um, flexibility, that entrepreneurial ability to to make my my business different in, in, Mm -hmm. uh, and the more consistent this stuff is, the more it becomes a, you know, ready, there's your meal in front of you, no changes, um, for want of a better word, it's, you know, it's like the the fixed menu versus the a la carte, you know, it's yeah. that, that's, that's it and all about it. Could I also argue, um, and, and, you know, this is probably bang sitting on the, the fence for some splinters, but in reality, the new car market has been a little bit like that in the past, you know, yeah. although we do high five each other when we've, you know, had a really good sales period on new cars, Arguably, as new cars and the control of the manufacturer, it yeah. probably is because it's the money they've put into the marketing, the campaigns that go behind it, the supply of those vehicles. It's all been a little bit out of control. And I, and again, going well, back purely the, the finance. Of, sorry, I'm cutting you off. The finance yeah. side of it is yeah, agency. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and if I go back twenty years, one of the things I was doing in consultancy back then was um, working with new car dealerships that were brilliant at selling new cars but uh, would were coming grinding themselves to a halt because they they used car facility had either been neglected or there was no focus <clears throat> on it or they didn't have the ability to to carry the stock that matched the new car volume that they were doing and they were finding those dealerships grinding almost to a halt mm-hmm. in terms of they've reached a plateau of new that they could sell because of the used cars that now that's changed a little bit because there's lots of ways of getting rid of that stock now that perhaps didn't exist in the same way. Um, but fundamentally, the used car business was always touted as the truly controllable part of your business. Mm. You know, you, when you're busy, you can buy, you know, if you make your used car business absolutely humming a great operation, stock turn of 10 times, you know, you buy the right stock, then, you know, it, you're controlling that, 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 that business yeah. now it, it's really the controllable part of the business the new cars have probably gone a little bit from that you know in terms of it's it's always been to a certain degree controllable by the the, the manufacturer's element of it well i, I suppose it's uh, no surprise that how many of our clients darren have started used car operations in some way shape or form uh I, I, yeah I, so many of them and they're popping up left front and center because again that is something that is uh, controllable there yeah. Um, uh, maybe a few. So listen, let's let's wrap this up by saying um, you're a DP listening to this. Uh, what advice do you have? What sort of nuggets? What would you be doing if you're back in dealership world now preparing for uh, everything we talked about? Agency possibly coming, uh, interest rates going up, supplier cars. What should we be focusing on now between now and the end of the year? Um. I, th- I think the real focus for me is don't don't just sit there and expect September to happen. And I, and I, I don't mean that in a patronising way, but um, I, you know, it, again, sorry to cut you off. I have to just explain that for the Australian uh, American market. This is a plate change uh, month in the UK market. Yeah. So yeah, sorry. And, and again, for for our listeners in other countries, I did, you know, it won't be dissimilar. The plate change might not be relevant, but. You, you might be closer down that track or you might be further away from that track, but it will happen. And, and it's just remembering that, you know, we have a team of people that are people. It's our job as a dealer principal there to get those people molded and ready. And, and what we would, would probably have used the term in the past, match fit and ready for what's coming their way. You know, are your team 
a little bit complacent because of what's been going on. Are we on top of every single one of those email leads that comes in or are we letting those email leads drive us if they're really important, they'll come back to us and they'll give us a call? Um, are we on them within that golden hour? Are we proactively sending out you know, videos of those vehicles, those used car vehicles, a nice personal vehicle um, walk around to, the, to those individuals? And is it going out within a reasonable period of time? Are we looking at creating our own showroom activity, you know, people coming into that showroom? Are we matching that with that's likely stock that we will be able to offer across that period? Because we can have 50 appointments, but if we've got 50 appointments on cars that we can't get, the, the, the sales rate's kind of irrelevant. We're going to have a, a job to do now. Um, and, and it's just remembering those little things that, you know, once, once we've got used to something, we actually physically have to you know, there has to be something that changes us because we've got comfortable with taking those low hanging fruits. OK, if we wait until one day it dawns on us that everything's changed, we'll be like that plumber that we talked about earlier. You know, he was really, really, really busy. But all of a sudden, everything stopped because he'd not done any marketing. And now he's in a you know six week period, very lean of business. And he's out every single day trying to canvas business. Yep. He's try he then ends up in a situation where he probably takes on jobs that he didn't want. He probably does them at prices that he didn't want to do to yep. keep himself busy. Um, and, and we'll be in that same boat. You know, If we can keep that same situation that we've got going and keep that strong demand for stock that we have and that we've got, then we will keep that going. We'll keep the strength of the, of the situation that we're in at the current moment and not suffer a big drop as a result of it. Yeah. Hey, listen, we just know in our business, Darren, and dealers are doing that. We've had people that we've not spoke to for a long time because quite yeah. frankly, they haven't had to. Saying, hey, can you get training between now and the end of the year? And we're stuck saying, no, we yeah. can't. We've got all our existing clients we're dealing with and it's trying to fit things in there. So I think there's lots of people out there are realizing they need to get better at the, yeah. what they're doing there. Yeah, for sure. Listen, thank you very much again for this. Uh, I hope you listeners got some good ideas and tips. And even if it's just thought provoking there, what you need to go back and put into your business um, and be interesting to see on this little rant that we both had, how much of it's going to be real? What's going to happen over the next uh, couple of years? Because I tell you what, it's uh, never. I uh, started when I was 17 years old. I'm 48 now. What's that? 31 years. I've never seen anything like what we've been through. So anyway, Darren, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Simon. It's been a pleasure. That just leaves me to say that all details of this episode and other episodes on the selling in the motor trade can be found on our website, simcotraining.co.uk. Go there to get a copy of our book, Words That Sell Cars. Go there to sign up to a free trial of our sales fitness online sales training program. Easiest way to get hold of me is Simon Bokert through LinkedIn.